well, I'm in a hotel in Dublin. And I'm here because tomorrow or the next day I'll be recording the audio version of the new book, All the Things That's Left Unsaid. It takes two days to to read it, and it takes about a year or a year and a half to write it. So, in many ways, I'm kind of nervous because I feel, you know, sometimes you put a lot of emotion into a book, and I think the only book that I did an audio of before was the first one, Stern at Lakes. And I remember being kind of emotional at certain times during the reading. You know, you'd, you'd be reading over very personal stuff in your life and then you start to get emotional. And now I, I feel a bit nervous because I think that's going to happen again. And, and particularly because this book has got, it's got very personal stuff in it in a, in a, a way that's completely new. I haven't done this in any other book previously. All the things that are left unsaid is a collection of letters to people that I lived with, worked with, was close with, loved, uh, people who have passed away. And now I'm kind of, I'm writing letters to them. And it was something I did as a practice over the 12 months, between 21 and 22, August 21, August 22. I, I felt I was healing from operations I was healing and I felt I'll go away I'll spend time on my own and I'll, I'll find some sort of practice you know some sort of way of meditating some sort of way to kind of sort of touch the moment because when you have a big moment in life and illness is a big moment it's actually good if you can if you can kind of go deeply into the experience Sometimes you have a big moment and you get distracted. You'd see people sometimes and they're having an, an, an intense, beautiful moment. Let's say they're, they're looking over a cliff with their loved one and you can see that they're a romantic couple and, and it's a beautiful blue sky and somewhere like Schlee of League in Donegal and it's just absolutely gorgeous and, and it's just so romantic. And you're looking at them, and they're totally caught up with taking the photograph of the view. And, and they're missing the moment. They're missing the, the silent, still moment of being present with each other. And we all do that. And I do it. So it, it's... It's more likely that you get distracted in pleasant, beautiful moments. And then in, in bad moments, sometimes you don't really want to remember them at all. People had often said that about a, an unpleasant experience. I don't want to remember it. Well, I suppose there's things that I don't want to remember either, but, but illness is not one of them because I felt... You know, you get an illness when you're my age, which is 69. It allows you to think about mortality. And so I thought it would be really beneficial to meditate. And I mean to meditate for a long while. And, and, and I was lucky because this place in Donegal came into my hands as a space that I could go and be alone for, you know, periods of five days at a time. And I used it as a workspace for the year. I went up there and I did these podcasts so that, in fact, if you go back over these podcasts from 21 August to 22, you could track the mood from week to week that I was in when I was making that journey. And that's why I end up in the podcast talking about different faith experiences and talking about prayer because because I was working at it. I was I was in there in the the little room in the heart. Do you know I do say 
go into the room inside in your own heart and be present and listen there. I was doing that, so I found it always easy to do podcasts. And you could relate that to the moods I was in from week to week, but you could also now read the book. And you see, I was looking for a practice. I was looking, what will I do in this 12 months to to make it a practice? And a prayer practice. And I decided, you know, I'll write to somebody that I can't write to. You know, somebody that I should have said more to them. And of course, that meant I was thinking about somebody who had passed away. And I thought, okay, I will write to this person. I will write a really, a kind of personal letter. And I will say to them all the things that I deeply feel but that I also regret that I didn't say it to them. Because because once somebody is gone, you don't have another chance to tell them that you love them or that you appreciate them or whatever. And so that's what I did for the year. And one letter led to the next until eventually I had Oh, I think about eight or nine of them. I'm not sure. I haven't even counted them. And that's the new book. Now, in that time, I was reflecting on faith, and I would explore maybe a little Buddhist idea or a little Islamic idea or whatever. And what struck me was that, you know, the the core of the whole religious idea, the core is the same in every religion. Now, I'm in a hotel this evening and I'm getting ready to record stuff in the morning and I'll be at it for two days and I'll be emotional because I'll be reading letters to real people who have passed away and I feel sorry about that and I'll get through it. And that will be available, and you can hear the book on audio, hopefully, when the book comes out at the end of October. So tonight, I thought, I'm sitting in the hotel on my own, I thought I'd love to share with you kind of three things, if you like. The first is something that I often share, and it's always worth doing it over and over again, and that is how how really confused and bewildered I am and how good it is to feel bewildered, how positive it is to feel bewildered. I just have a sense that certainty must be an awful affliction. You know, and sometimes I fall into it. I mean, there are times when I get an opinion about let's say, politics or religion, and I start to grip the opinion with a clenched fist. I I start to kind of really sort of say this is true. And and this, the little idea becomes a kind of a nugget in your fist of truth. And the minute you start doing that, I think it's a sign that you're unwell. You're beginning to... You're beginning to layer a sense of meaning and rationality around your experience of being alive. So, if you like, being alive without opinions, being alive almost without thoughts, that would be, I suppose, to me, a way of thinking about heaven. It would be a way of thinking about peace. You know, that when my heart is just feeling a kind of connectedness with the world around me, and when my heart is feeling a kind of a a warm, reaching out affection towards everybody around me, but there's, there's no thought behind it, well, then that would be bliss. And that is the true nature of being human. And that's a lovely template that they have in Islam, that such is 
the root nature of being human is just being there in that in that condition of course that means in a sense that you're completely given to the other to to god you know that there's there's no interference from an idea from an opinion from an attitude from a politics from a sense of anything you're just kind of awake in yourself and you experience this sense of transcendence or otherness that that you know the transcendent self there's some sense of that you are present to otherness and it's so close to buddhism so close to martin buber's idea of i and thou this sense of just being here now and so in islam they said that that's the natural condition and then everything that you layer on top of it is is kind of false you know sense of ego sense of narrative a sense of history a sense of meaning and everything is as my great teacher said to me one time and i have a podcast done about this about a year ago it, it's like your soul is just an open th- thing and everything that you like every way you think is like putting a knot in your soul so your ego is a knot in your soul your attachments your your valuations of money or your desires for all sorts of different experiences your education and even your religion is in itself a knot in the soul so that this there's this sense of kind of releasing yourself from all that and just being in a kind of a what they'd say in buddhism a calm abiding you're just here now and that's it and i found in the past 12 months when i was doing my little retreat and writing the book i found that that was that, that was the place i ended up in no matter where i started from like if if, if i took let's say a christian technique of prayer or if i took a an Islamic technique of prayer, if I took a Buddhist practice of meditation, I always ended up in the same place, which was kind of reaching towards that stillness, that sense of calm abiding of just being here now. And and that amazed me because I hadn't really challenged myself about different religions or any religion for a long time and let me tell you, doing a podcast is a way of challenging yourself because it really it kind of exposes you, in a sense. I might be here sitting on my own in a hotel room, but you are listening. And I do it knowing that you're listening and trying to be as open as I can when I am sharing this with you. Well, that's fairly challenging. It's also fairly challenging because you know that when you do a podcast and you know you leave it available it's going to be available for a while maybe a very long time i i find i get a real enrichment from that because you get enrichment the more you give in a relationship and even if our relationship you and me is like entirely and strictly to do with the fact that you know, you're a subscriber to a podcast and you listen to my voice. Okay, but it's still, even within that, there is a give and take. There is a sense where I can be, or try to be, generous with the story I tell or with the emotions I share. And then I receive back a kind of an enrichment on that. And I also I also receive back a sense of clarity in my own mind, because... You know yourself, you don't know what you're going to say until you say it. There's a way in which I come to sit down at a podcast on some subject 
I have notes done about some subject I want to talk about, and and then I I kind of find that I'm going off in a direction like a tangent, but it's always a tangent of of pure truth or pure honesty from my point of view. And then I finish the podcast sometimes, and I think I'm glad I said that, even though before I start, I didn't intend to. And it there's an interesting way that communicating with somebody like that it can have a spontaneity that you didn't plan it but it can also have what I might call a rudder you know a a rudder a kind of a way that that you can direct where the boat is going to go even though you don't quite know where it's going to go and let me give you an example I was in company last weekend and there was three of us spending a weekend together and we were in a particular house and on the Friday night and the Saturday night there was dinner and a couple of drinks and a bit of fun and a bit of chat and at the end at the end of the meal the conversation always would move into serious subjects including religion and politics and whatever. And there was one particular, the first night, it was like a beautiful harmony between people, right? And in the background, by accident, there was music by Clannad, the Irish group, and the beautifully calm music. And that was grand. Now, the following evening, we were having a conversation in the same way after the dinner and I noticed that there was an air of rancour coming in to the conversation on the part of everybody. And then I noticed by accident that I had put on a particular sort of rock singer who is very famous and, and absolutely the top of his game like a pure global genius and I got the feeling that, you know, it was the wrong kind of music. It was it was inducing agitation at the table. And so, unbeknownst to the other two guests, I slipped out and I changed the music back to Clannad. And I swear to God, within about ten minutes, the rancor had gone and people were finding consensus and relaxing and enjoying themselves again. I'm not suggesting, and this is not a promotion for Clannad, that their music should be used to calm people down. But what I'm saying is, there is a connection between where a conversation goes and underlying directional forces. And if if you have, for example, background music in a room that's calming, it's almost difficult to get agitated enough to have an argument. And the same goes for, I suppose, the opposite. If you if you are playing beautiful, wonderful rock and roll music, but but music which I think it's fair to say, always has a sense of edge to it and a sense of agitation to it. You know, you might find it hard to calm down. So, when it comes to being present, being here now, I find that that becomes, in some sense, a way of living the ordinary life. In other words, if you did five minutes of a meditation in the morning, five minutes of meditation in the evening, or whatever you want, it becomes a kind of a, it becomes like the clan of music through the day. Or, for example, if you listen to, do you know there's, I mentioned it before, you can get an app. If you, if you go into the app store, and you look for um, Islam prayer app, you'll come up with a whole variety of simple apps that will actually give you a signal five times a day 
when it is appropriate for the Muslim to pray. And even if you're not a Muslim, but the call to prayer, the kind of external reminder, middle of the night, before dawn, early in the morning, afternoon, late in the day, sunset, and back again, that kind of rhythm, if, if you just try that and you just stop yourself for 30 seconds or 60 seconds to remind yourself of what you'd call God's presence, I'll come to that now in a minute, but, but if you use that kind of rhythm, and th th there's they have it in, in Buddhism as well, you'll, you'll get Zen bell. You know, there's, there's Zen, there's apps that will give you a sort of a Zen reminder. It'll go off every hour or you can set it to go off every six hours. And it's just a bell, just a simple, pure bell. And when it goes off, you know that this is an external call reminding you of the awakened mind, if you like, the awakened mind that is within you the blue sky that is within you, underneath or beyond all the clouds of your disturbing emotions. And I found that a very, very useful technique of using something like an app. But also if you just do your own gig, you know, that you just take a minute or two minutes once a day, twice a day, five times a day, whatever. And, and don't underestimate the pure magic of those times when there is a call to prayer in Islam. Because those times are also used in Buddhism and in Christianity as times that are psychically ready. They're psychically ripe. One of them is the transition from light to darkness, you know, just before just before sunrise or just before sunset. And and you get loads of Buddhist texts who'll say the same thing that it's a very, very auspicious time to meditate is when, you know, the world is changing and turning over from darkness to light or from light to darkness. And if if you live a busy life and you watch a lot of television and Netflix, and I do all those things. And you don't get, like, 30-minute morning sessions, you know, in the cool of your studio with lotus plants outside. If you just have, like, a minute, it still works because it, it only takes a minute to tap into this mystery of presence. And if you do it, do you know, if you do it, like, say, at sunset or, or, or sunrise, that becomes a pattern so that you'll find at some stage that you're not controlling the process because, because the world is changing every 24 hours from your point of view. And so the, the darkness falling will begin to call you to prayer. And the light, you'll waken in the morning and you'll open your eyes and, you know, you'll ha you know the moment where, the moment where you can see, let's say, the back of your hand, but you can't see the lines in the front of your hand. That kind of dawn moment. And, of course, if, if you trigger yourself to give that a minute and think about God's presence, well, eventually, after a certain time, the dawn will actually give you the signal. And you'll feel like a bird. You know the way the bird is cued to sing. And the dawn comes. And you'll feel like a bird. You'll feel like you are a being responding to the turning of the whole globe on its axis. And you'll begin to start noticing that, you know, mid-morning or, or afternoon are also... Times that are very different from each other. 
There's a great uh, actor, Yoshi Oida. He's a Japanese actor, and he used to always say, what you can act, you know, if you were in a show at 8 o'clock every night, there are emotions you can act, but if you were in a lunchtime show, you can't you can't do the text in the same way. You have to find a, a different level of emotional engagement if you're performing in the middle of the day. And it, it is true that that there are that there are emotions you can have at eleven in the morning and, and in some way they're actually clocked by the sun, by the light, by the the fact that you're you're just kind of you're rising into the middle of the day, but you're not quite there yet. It's like being young. And the afternoon is a similar time. The the afternoon is a you know, it's a, it's a time where you feel if you've accomplished good things at that point in the afternoon on your daily chores, you'll feel a momentum. Or if the day has been going wrong for you, you'll feel exhausted. So so there's there's a whole lot of stuff affects. And then of course there's there's evening, that sense, you know that pleasurable feeling when you're when you're coming close to the end of the day. And then there's sunset. Those times in the day, four of them, and put another one on to make five, the fifth one then is the middle of the night. And isn't, isn't it amazing, the middle of the night, that, that strange way that the whole house that you're living in becomes different when it's silent and when maybe the street lights are coming in the window, spilling in the light into maybe a kitchen. Or maybe moonlight. And you're wandering around the house just because you get up and you want a, a glass of water in the middle of the night or something. And it's like the world asleep, the house asleep is such a different place. And in those five periods, in those five moments through the, the day, in Islam, it's like you're trying to surrender to the the very essence of your own being. Which in Islam is God. It is God who holds you up. The otherness. The one who the one who is holding you, loving you, minding you. Keeping this awareness on you. So that you feel almost watched, gazed upon in a loving way. That sense of relationship, that sense of rapport. Just being there on your own still in the presence of, of what? Of nothing? It's a moment in the day. It's dawn, it's sunset, it's morning, it's evening, it's the middle of the night. And it's a different feeling in each moment and yet each one can be a door into this experience of God's presence. And if you try that rhythm, even for one day, you'll have a very rich day. Try it. And it's, it's like you're only using from the outside. It's, you're simply using the wisdom of Islam, you know, by just like taking it from the outside in a terribly simplistic way. Obviously, the, you know, what I'm saying is not Islam, but it's like it's like me in my bewildered life trying to pick up these little crumbs of wisdom from different traditions. And that one in Islam of, of linking a sense of being aware of God's presence at particular points of the day. That's the trick. That's the... So, and, and they all use it. I mean, the Christians use it. I mean, the monks and the nuns, they're medieval as they were. They'd be getting up and the bell would go in the morning and all the rest of it, you know. Same time every morning, all the rest of it. And I can tell you, the masters of it, sure, are the Zen and the, the Buddhist monks, you know, who'd... 
when I did I did a long retreat one time a Tibetan Buddhist retreat and uh, it the kind of shape of it was set out for me by my teacher well I was going to be in a room on my own completely isolated completely isolated 24 7 for a number of days and I thought I'll get bored but when he had prescribed the, you know the amount of times to do various meditations and say various prayers they were all marked out like there was one in the morning I think we start I started about six and then that was a preliminary to another one which would be really the morning prayer at seven and then there was like something to do at nine and something to eleven and twelve should the day was full by the time I got to eight o'clock and I'd be doing my final little meditation for the day I was sure I was exhausted but it was all about marking kind of the hours of the day and the hours is what they call it in the Christian monastic tradition, you know, where they have the matins and lauds and vespers, different times of the day, and they say the prayer. So, so there's something that, like, I hadn't really thought about that as much until I started looking at different religions and comparing them one to the other. And I began to notice, not just that every religion was talking about uh, kind of being here now as, as the sort of essence of what they were all trying to get at, but I noticed that every religion also had a kind of a, a way that implied timing is significant. To choose a time, to say to yourself, like, I'm going to become aware of God's presence at dawn. And I'll, I'll put it on my phone as a little blip. And just for those 60 seconds, nobody will know what I'm doing, but I will be doing it, becoming aware just of the presence. And if I do that at dawn, my sense of what I'm, pre I'm aware of is different than if I do it at sunset. or in the middle of the day, or in the afternoon, and it's different than how I would experience the same moment if it was four o'clock in the morning. So you see what I'm saying, that, that a sense of trying to become aware of God's presence is not consistent. It changes because your sense of what that might be, that there's a kind of a sense of what you are present to is different because it's coming through the lens of, of time. Time itself is kind of a lens. Time is not absolute, it's like just this lens. And that's, that's one big thing I like to share with you today and and it's Islam has a beautiful very refined idea of that which is what all their call to prayer is about and even if you set it up for yourself in a very simple way even if you set it up for a system whereby you're, you're just like taken 30 seconds out of your day for this sort of moment of to remember the presence of God you do that you, this this is totally possible for those who are secular and who don't have a sense of faith that is kind of explicit in the way that I do but you could call it mindfulness and it would be like using mindfulness and 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 being mindful at different times of the day and noting that the experience of mindfulness is very very different from sunset to sunrise or in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day completely different 
and yet the same. Mindfulness. The jury, in my head, the jury's out on that one, you know. It's so, so important, so beneficial to people, and to me too, when I was suffering mental depression, I used to use mindfulness. Got me out of a dark hole, I can tell you. But then I like to to go over the threshold where it's just not me alone struggling in my mindfulness, but me releasing myself, surrendering myself into a greater presence. So that all leads me to the the second and third point I want to cover in this conversation from the hotel in Dublin. I want to talk about what that presence is. I mean, I'm always trying to talk about that difficult word, God, or what's the experience for which we use the word. And I want to talk about it as well in this podcast in relation to something else, and that is bewilderment. So I'm going to talk about God. I'm going to talk about God's presence. Right, so there's a big deal. And I'm going to talk about bewilderment. And it'll tell you how conflicted I am. It'll tell you, <clears throat> you know the way that a human being can contain completely opposing points of view, or I think there's a word for it in sociology or so social psychology to talk about dissonance, you know, that you can have clusters of of attitudes or opinions or views that cohere with each other, and then you can have another cluster that are really incompatible with the first cluster. And we seem, as human beings, to have the capability of holding contradictory positions or contradictory worldviews. And it, it may be interesting that the very fact that we are capable of that may actually be another layer of insight about what we are as human beings. But the way that it presents itself to me and the dissonance for me is always to do with God because I believe in God, because I believe I, I believe that in some way, as somebody said, the molecules are not neutral. The electrons are not indifferent. There is in everything a sense of opposites reaching towards each other in love. And I think that God, for me, begins and ends with that idea that God is not an object. God is relationship. Relationship. It's not... You know, people think, oh, relationship means me and God. That's what you're talking about. But, but it's actually the relationship that is God. Relationship of one electron to a proton, one atom to another, one molecule to another. Relationship of, of light to darkness. Relationship of you to me. Relationship of one thing to another in love. And, and how that, how relationship expresses itself, each one reaching for the other, each one kind of embracing the other, each one in, in some sense holding the other. The electron holds or is held by the proton. But, but also there's a sense that I hold you, you hold me. Sometimes you, you, you look at your children and you're looking at them and they are, as, as they say, a joy to behold. 
You're holding them. Behold is to hold. To behold is not just to see, not just to look, and it's not just to physically hold, but to behold. Is to, is to gaze in self-forgetfulness, whether it be the Quran or the Eucharist or your beloved or your child, to behold. You, you could give a 10-hour lecture on prayer and the beginning and end would be just the one word. Behold. Behold. Become aware with your whole body of the other. And that other who is it? The object may be your husband, your wife, your father, your son, your daughter, your mother. That object may be the stranger, the poor person, the whatever. But but the object is not God. God is not an object. God is not a... God is the relationship. You can't, you can't even explain what is really... You might as well try to explain gravity. Or explain the draw between positive and negative in the little world of quantum physics. Like, I mean, I don't know anything about science. But when it comes to the very way that something exists in relationship to something else, I don't think there's any naming it, except... It's just there. It, it is. This is the way it is. And in that sense, because you have a body, because you are embodied spirit, when you become mindful, you also become aware of this sense of being held. You behold the mystery of presence that is around you and you experience the sense of that presence around you, holding you. You develop a relationship with the environment, with the trees, with the lake, with nature. You behold. And I suppose that's why, again, the famous icon maker, Andrei Rublev, when he was working on that great icon of the Trinity, which is the icon that you see just about everywhere, it is the icon of the Trinity nowadays. It's three angels sitting around a table and a cup of wine at the centre. And it has so many references to the Christian tradition and to you know, moments in the Jewish tradition. But essentially, what's in that icon is relationality. It's not an icon of angels, but it's an icon of relationship. Which is what the Christians were getting at when they started talking about the Trinity, God as a Trinity. I mean, they weren't, they weren't trying to say God as Trinity because there was something kind of willfully intellectual about thinking about, you know, God and his Son and his Holy Spirit and all this crack. It, it, it's, just, it's just the dynamic of God as transcendent and the earth as the kind of incarnation of being, that, that there is a kind of a relationship between the world at the surface and the depth that's hidden underneath the world. And it's one of love. So, so that's God. Now, next step, 
bewilderment. I am so bewildered. I mean, I'm not sure what the word means exactly, but it's used in the rural Ireland that I come from for a certain condition of being uncertain. And that's what I'd like to go on to, and probably in the next month, that is, we're starting September now, and I'm going to try and talk a lot about this. It's it's to do with the fact that up until now, I'm trying to reflect on the way that different religions affect me and how certain practices in different religions are beneficial to me. And I use them as psychotherapy and they, they help me be a happier person, right? But... There's a huge, huge problem. It's like, the best way to put it is that the ultimate teaching is there is no teaching. That that when you name the bird, you cease to experience the song. The best way to put it is that when you actually put your finger on the truth, you can be damn sure that's not the truth. And that's a strange, strange dynamic in the human mind. But for me, that's the liberation. In other words, everywhere that I am leading you towards a little bit of insight into Christian prayer, Buddhist prayer, Jewish philosophy, or Islamic prayer, every time I lead you close to that by these meditations, it is in order, in some way, it's in order to break it up. It's in order to sort of find that transcendence is always transcendent. It's always beyond. It is always completely beyond any way we think about it. So that the minute you get an insight or an idea about religion, like this is a really good practice or this is a devotion or this is a prayer that would help me, and you get there, there's one more step. And that final step is real, realizing that that in itself is not the truth. It may be, you know, like a pointer at the truth, the same way as the finger points at the moon, but the finger is not the moon. And that's where I want to go. Because the door into that is your own personal bewilderment. There's, there's a way in which, I know this in my life, I get anxious and uneasy that the world is kind of going on without me. And the older you get, the more you feel that. You, you feel that young people have, they're kind of running away with new ideas and you can't control it. Or there's information on the internet that you can't access. Or there's political things happening and you can't understand them. And it's like it's it's like the whole thing is sort of a an information game and you're more and more being left on the outside of it. And what happens then is that you rush for some way to name your meaning. You rush for some way to say, Well, this is what I believe. And you become kind of absolute, and if you have some sort of religious tradition behind you, you can tend to use it in a way that you, you have a clenched fist around it. And you say with your clenched fist, this is the truth. And everything that I do in my podcasts implies not just that the truth is there in the Christian tradition, but it's also there in in all the other traditions, Islamic or Jewish or Hindu or Buddhist. It's there everywhere. And having said that, the ultimate, final thing is to see that those truths are only the finger pointing at the moon. And you then have to, in some sense, be transformed and be bewildered. 
And that's the whole conversation I'm going to start up in September. How bewildered am I? How confused am I? And how it's okay? Now, if, if you're really lost at sea, and you're, you're anxious, and you, you feel you need to know where you are, and you don't know where you are, you're not happy. But there is a way in faith, and this is true in all the different traditions as well. There is, we're, we're, to be honest, I suppose we're into the advanced course now. Because in every religious tradition, there is a point at which everything you've learned, everything you've practiced, you let go of. You let go of everything just to be in the present moment. You learn the rules and then you forget the rules. That's what Basho says. Somebody else said, it's like playing tennis without the net. You kind of know where the net is, but it's not there. You go beyond the rules of your religion. You go beyond the, the sense of your religion being the truth. You absorb the, the riches of it, the prayerful techniques, the, the beautiful, rich, mythic stories and the insights that give you some sense of your own soul and your own being and then and then you let go of it the, the ultimate and final step of being at peace with yourself is not knowing I think that you have to go through the door of religion I think that if you don't you know, religions are languages that have evolved over thousands of years as sort of narratives that give a meaning to existence. And to live outside them is to live at a very superficial level. So I actually feel that religion is necessary, but it's necessary in order to free yourself from religion because the journey the spiritual path in all religions is to, to love the religion and to study it and to practice it and to particularly practice prayer so that at some point it all falls away and you see that it was actually only a scaffolding holding you in the present moment. And that's what I'd love to talk about and share with you in the next podcast. I hope I remember it. Sometimes I promise to do a podcast and then I forget because something else arises. But for now, that's it. And thank you for being here. Bye-bye.